Hey guys, I'm on. Uh, I had to take a bit of a break. Uh, so, I heard a bunch of really abstract stuff the last couple times. And uh, I want to get back to that because I think there's more to develop, but I kind of don't want to push it too hard because I've been thinking this weekend and. Uh, and uh, I think I want to get a little bit more comfortable about moving forward without getting too wacky and too abstract. Or at least that's how I'm going to try to plan to go. So uh, today instead, I feel like uh, this is going to be a low-key chill stream. This is going to be hang stream. Unless something pops off. Uh, and that could happen. But... I'm going to start chill. Just the lazy Monday. Lazy Monday. I'd like to start by just uh, addressing a weird thing I've seen people say in the chat here and elsewhere that I am on some sort of uh, regime of uh, uppers. Like I'm popping pills. Uh, people are naming stuff that I actually don't even know what it is, like monodophil. I've never heard of that. Uh, I. I don't do uppers. Uh, as a recovering hypochondriac, they're very bad f for someone like me because I would just be waiting for my heart to explode anyway. But anyway, I just want to, if anyone's worried about me, I just want to make sure that there's nothing to worry about. I'm not on uppers. Sometimes I just get a little excited. I don't have any new tropics, though. Now, I would love... Maybe I should get some Gorilla Mind and try to get a get a really uh, intense stack. Uh, no more new tropics. How about some nut tropics? Tacoma wept, folks. Tacoma wept. It still blows my mind that there are people who tell me like I like both of you guys and you should debate and it's like what is what is it that you like I mean I get it you know people like things for different reasons but we seem to be sort of that him and me and that guy seem to be sort of differently on a different wavelength to the point where it seems hard to imagine that a conversation would be very fruitful I mean the guy thinks that like there's such a thing as pushing the Democrats left at this point, at this late date. How do you talk to somebody who's that removed from reality? It's like talking to that lady who wrote the uh, In Defense of Looting book that people are posting clips from that made my eyes bleed. But it is funny, I gotta say. There's some real... Uh, there's some real characters out there. I'll say that. I don't know. I I I wonder if I would want to uh, debate anyone because I'm I, I used to. I'll admit this. Like, and I think a lot of people who uh, who really hold the never debate anybody standard are still gripped by this. A big reason people are hostile to debate is because they don't know why they believe their beliefs. And so they're afraid of losing. I mean, they won't put it that way. That's why they invent all that stuff about not validating point of views that shouldn't be debated in the first place. It's a lack of confidence in their ability to engage with the argument effectively for a third party. Because obviously you're not going to ever change anyone's mind in a debate. It's always for the benefit of an audience. It's always for the benefit of a presumably uh, unaffiliated audience. And that... I can imagine there in certain circumstances a debate could be useful along those lines. And I think people don't, they, they, they reject that because they assume, no, everyone on every side, everyone who could possibly hear any argument is by definition on one side or another and if they aren't admitting it, they're lying about it. Uh, so I think, you know, there could be uses for a debate, but I don't know and now I feel much more confident in myself and in my ability to explaticate like more uh, abstract ideas that 
before I maybe kind of like had an inkling of, but I couldn't really grasp because I hadn't dug down. I hadn't really pulled up the earth of my, of my priors. Uh, and I feel like, I mean, obviously I'll never be done doing that. Uh, there will always be blind spots. That's the definition. That's the defining. That is the, 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 the absence, the lack of understanding in the universe that you have is, is, is the sum total of your, of your personal existence. Because the rest of it is everything. And if you had all of it, you'd be everything. The thing that makes you less than that, the things that make you perceive yourself as separate from that, which you are part of, is ignorance. Uh, oh, and yeah, the Zizek-Peterson uh, debate is a perfect example uh, of a debate that was pretty clearly a good idea because, I mean, obviously other things happened in his life, but I think, I think Peterson sort of lost a little credibility, maybe even not like with a broad audience, but even maybe with himself after that because he was just so unable to, to grapple with the stuff that Zizek was talking about because he was, he just, Zizek has has grounded his belief so much more deeply that he could just engage him. Sometimes talking about this stuff on here, I kind of wonder if my my project is with the vlogs and shit is just synthesizing Peterson and fucking Zizek. And of course, the winner in that would be would be Zizek, but you know, you would have to thread some Peterson into it anyway. I mean, the grill pill, as people have pointed out, is a lot like clean your room. But, you know, uh, in that it, it is a fixation on like how practical engagement with the world around you can lead towards introspection and, uh, and growth uh, and that you know the way we think is largely shaped by symbolic orders uh, but beyond that it's just a bunch of you know barely thought out reactionary gibberish clean your trash can there you go that'd be perfect Damn, that's not bad. Clean your, <laughs> clean your trash can. <laughs> I guess it'd be empty your trash can, but that wouldn't be as symmetrical. I don't know. That's good. But yeah, I would debate somebody, but it would depend on who. It would have to be somebody who had like a very interesting conflict with. But somebody who says, you're a class reductionist who, who is hurting... Uh, hurting minorities and poor people by not supporting Joe Biden for president as a podcaster? I'm sorry, but that's not... The amount of digging you would have to do to even get to anything like a stable foundation to build from would take too long. This guy is, uh, he's shadow boxing. The thing is, I wouldn't debate class reductionists because who, who are we even talking about there? I think that's mostly a term of abuse. I've talked about how class reductionism is just this thing people put out there to try to uh, just undermine the argument with 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 a a a term of abuse. I mean, it's 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 to predetermine to precondemn the argument, especially since from a technical perspective, everyone who has a, like a genuine I think a useful analysis of the situation would say, of course, it's a class reduction because class is the, is the signal friction point within a society. It is the first and fundamental friction point in a society is along class lines. And you can disagree with that, fine. But then calling me a class reductionist is stupid because you're not in the same thing that I'm in. So anything you call me is sort of beside the point. The class reductionist argument is what's supposed to be within the left and assumes that like there's a that there that that is some sort of violation of an orthodoxy. No, it's a confirmation of the most basic orthodoxy of any meaningful Marxist inflected socialist analysis. The question that people uh, like what they're trying to say there is that, well, by by recognizing this thing, which is obvious and which is to my in my mind foundational uh, by doing that. You are somehow implying a tactical approach that means that engaging with uh, superstructural uh, uh, alienations like racism and misogyny uh, is therefore not to be engaged with and ignored and deprioritized. And that 
The concerns of people with exploitations that emerge from those superstructures should be ignored. Some people might believe that, but I, it is a, in my opinion, from my observations, a fraction of the larger group of people that generally get called class reductionists. I think most people who, who, are, who are realistic and who understand that the base superstructure relationship is reinforcing, it's not just gener it's not just a one-way flow, it is a circulation whereby social friction is turned into superstructure that, that dissipates the social friction in one way, but creates new sources of alienation that have that then inflect the sup the base again. And, ha and, and make it accommodate that. And that's what capitalism has been doing over the last 40 years along race, racism, for example. Uh, it has been super structurally accommodating, but also, uh, uh, in, but in ways that then reinforce and change capitalism. That's what recuperation is. And that's what capitalism has done with these issues. But that doesn't mean that they're not felt, and it doesn't mean that they are not, that those exploitations, because they emerge from capitalism, must be addressed at the same time, at the same level, or else people will be alienated from your attempt to, uh, to defeat the thing that is causing all of the horror in the first place, because they won't take you seriously. Because they will reject you. And... What the, what the stupid argument online did is because it created an incentive to build this cudgel to use, first, by the way, by the fucking Hillary people. Let's not forget that all that started with the Hillary people in 2016, before anybody, any of these motherfuckers even thought they were socialists. When Hillary said, breaking up the banks won't end racism, therefore don't even bother. But then when the tent got bigger after Trump's win, all of a sudden, you have people who are saying, I'm the most socialist person in the world. And the worst thing about socialism and, and the worst socialists and the ones we need to kick out are the class reductionists. It's like, I'm sorry, aren't you just applying the Hillary uh, blood libel within the tent so that you can like get more influence? And that's where some people say, yeah, that's, that's the infiltration and, and domination of the PMC. And that's my fundamental disagreement with that analysis, with like the new class notion that the real class divide now is between this professional class and everyone else. Uh, because I don't think that that, even if it does create channels whereby for, conforming to that uh, status quo gets you advanced, like in the media or whatever, it's not generated there. It's generated by, because it's super structural, because it's in the discourse, it's uh, generated by a desire to to be heard, and to be taken seriously, and to be validated, because that's what the internet is for. The internet is a validation machine. And when we go on Twitter to do politics, we are going on Twitter to be validated. And so that turns us into a little, as I have said, like uh, uh, a little ego-driven entrepreneurs trying to validate themselves. I sure as shit know that's why I started going on Twitter, was to be validated was to have my dumb opinions taken seriously and my dumb jokes laughed at. And what that means is, is that you can't argue anyone out of that position. None of these positions can be argued out of. And I think one of the main ways that you can cut down on, on online political addiction, uh, one I've said is to filter subjects by importance to you so you don't have to care about anything. And then secondly, I would say on top of that, add a, uh, a, an additional filter where you can divide arguments into two types. Because part of one of the big reasons people get stuck on this hamster ball is because there is this deep brain confusion between two types of arguments. There are arguments to be had that are had because people disagree on a course of action and have to try to decide between each other how to go forward. That is a model that has two th that has stakes for the people involved in the argument. And because it has stakes, it tends to resolve towards a, a satisfactory resolution. Because 
It's like there's two people who who want to who are in a car, and they there's they're trying to drive somewhere and they disagree on the best route. They have to decide if they want to get to that place. And so even though they might be heated and they'll be heated because they want to get there, they will also be focused by that anger towards resolving something. At least over time, of course, some people are going to fly off the handle and be psychos and but I'm talking about in general people who are are able to control their emotions enough to engage with other people will come to a point where they resolve to do something. Then there's the other type of argument, the type that is basically the only type of argument you see online, which is an argument that exists to be had. There is no place on the other side of town that anybody needs to get to. It is hypothetically arguing about the best way to get somewhere, that nobody involved in the argument has to go. And that's Twitter. It's people, it's five million people in a car arguing about the best way to get to a place, but they're not in a car and there's no place. That argument exists as recreation. That exa- argument exists, as I said, to be argued, which means you need two sides and they need to keep going against each other to maintain the, the dynamic, the, the illusion of forward progress that satisfies your desire to be entertained. And every argument online, like what is class reductionism, that doesn't exist to do anything. What are you going to get out of this? Especially, as I have said, because of the way that online demands bad faith and therefore uh, uh, will never allow for anyone to give anybody any point and will uh, uh, impute bad motives to invalidate reasonable arguments. But the real problem is not just that it's entertaining, it's that the people involved in these arguments, because they don't do politics in the real life for the most part, or because the politics in the real life are shaped so much by what they what they see online, which dominates their emotional landscape, they argue it with the intensity and urgency of someone who is arguing to get to an actual resolution. Even though the the, the, the tone called for in a uh, in an argument to be had is playful. It's like when your friend, that it's like, it's the difference between trying to argue with your friend about like where to get to the hospital when one of you've been shot in the leg or something, uh, the best way to get there, and your friend's arguing at a party about who would beat, if Superman could beat up the Terminator or whatever the fuck. Like the, 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 that, if the, that sh- can get out of hand, hand, but in general, you're just kidding around because there is no stakes. There's no stakes to be had. You're all just you're shooting the shit, and arguing is a fun way to have a fun conversation if it's done in fun. And that's the arguments online essentially. And there's nothing necessarily wrong with that. People need to have fun, but people are arguing these these positions as though they were arguments about how to get to the hospital with a bullet wound. Obviously Superman could not obviously Superman would beat up the Terminator. I was just kind of pulling names out of my ass. How about the Terminator versus Robocop? There's a good one. Robocop beat the Terminator? I honestly don't know if that's what would happen. Because you got to feel like the, the, the human gooey part of, Termina- of Robocop are more vulnerable than the Terminator. Because he could leave all of his uh, tissue uh, and still have his exoskeleton. Uh, 
I mean, of course RoboCop would beat the Terminator because RoboCop's the good guy. I mean, that's the real... That's why those questions are so fun and stupid and have to be recreational. Because the real answer to the, all of them boils down to the good guy would win. Because they're all just artificial concepts structured to uh, adhere to certain narrative uh, conventions. So lighten the fuck up. If you're going to have fun batting things around, remember the stakes. They're basically zero. Because the decision, your dis if you really, people can say, and people say this all the time, they say, you say Twitter isn't real life, but people take that stuff and those ideas and they apply it to the real life. And I say, yes, they do. But I would, I just think that, uh, that what ends up happening more often than not, because of how obviously small and disorganized the left is, is not what some people think, which is people bring bad ideas from the internet online or offline, and then they, they dominate with those ideas and they scare everybody away. Uh, I don't think that's what happens. I think what happens is is that people come from online with these weird, intense uh, 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 expectations related to the fantasy worlds they've constructed there. Uh, and then they, uh, and then some of them who have the intensity of, of purpose and, and frankly, willing to, willingness to be shameless and annoying, maybe they do dominate some sectors of the real like left or whatever. But since it's so small, I think the answer for what happens with the rest of people is not that they are alienated by that. It's that the vast majority of, first of all, remember, most people aren't engaging in this at all. But the ones who are, they, their engagement with online has created their own structure, right? And they do bring it offline. But they bring it offline by using the fact that they see all this cringe bullshit on the internet as an excuse to do nothing. And then there's a third group who bring their shit offline and try to apply it to the real world, get conflict from that and f feedback, and then run away and are broken against the rocks of reality and decide to flee back. So you've got one group of people who have like the, the, the perfect combination of brittle uh, internet poisoning and, and, and remaining uh, like personal... Uh, uh, grit i guess to stick stick out long enough to win battles over things like you know a fucking dsa uh uh local election but then you have much larger groups of people who either can't hack the the uh the social demands of trying to be a pill in the real world and the ones who use what they see online as an excuse to stay home and then of course there's most importantly, the fourth group of people who might be online might encounter these ideas, but would never think of getting political, who don't, aren't touched to the level of action, aren't stirred to the level of action by any of this. Favorite Roman Emperor. I know it's a, a, a popular revisionist pick to pick Aurelian because he basically single-handedly saved the empire from uh, early death and then was nonetheless uh, killed by his own dumb troops. He's like a, he's like a, a sort of underrated uh, dude making a comeback. He's fine. Uh, I guess Trajan. Because everyone forgets him, but he, he presided over the creation of Rome to its fullest physical extent. That's pretty cool. And he did it with an amazingly terrible bowl cut. I mean, yeah, sure, Roman nerds remember Trajan. I'm just saying in popular culture, he's not very well remembered among the emperors. But that's mostly because the most remembered ones are the worst ones. Someone wants me to ask, talk about P2 Lodge. I didn't talk about it on the Gladio episode, but just a quick refreshers. I don't know that much about it. Sadly, there aren't a lot of great 
English language uh, uh, <clears throat> uh, sources on Gladio, and I, from what I understand, not great Italian stuff either, but it was a Freemason's Lodge in, Ro in Rome uh, that was essentially a front for a group of high-level Italian political, religious, military, and economic leaders to get together and distribute money to neo-fascist gangs who'd been armed by NATO uh, in order to do things like launder Corsican uh, drug money through the Vatican Bank and uh, carry out what was called the strategy of tension, which was a series of terrorist attacks that were carried out by neo-fascist street gangs allied with the mafia uh, and on the left. Oh, uh, it's funny because the uh, it was a Masonic lodge and it had a number of high levels of the Catholic Church as clergy or as uh, members. Even though in the 19th century, uh, a papal uh, edict forbid all Catholic, I think it was just Catholic, uh, not all, I think it was all Catholics actually from becoming Freemasons. All, like even lay people, let alone fucking cardinals and stuff. Oh, so a young Silvio Berlusconi was a member. I don't think Don Jr. is going to become a uh, uh, president because he's going to like he's going to make sense as an option, but he's just he doesn't have he doesn't have it. He doesn't have what his dad has. And Ivanka looked really good at the convention, but I'm still not convinced that the Re the Republican Party wants what she's selling in terms of uh, affect and and whatnot. She just seems a little too. I mean, the, they're going to all be Q people within four years, you know? Like, Q is going to take over the entire Republican base. That is inevitable. And I don't know if Ivanka... She has the bloodline, you know, but I just don't know if she has the... She has the brand to catch them. But I don't know. Finger, shrug emoji, I have no idea. Yeah, everyone's gonna. All Republicans are gonna be Q. It's the only. It's the only way forward because, because like I said, it's the only way to square living in this country and having this image of America in your head that you can't challenge for deeper ideological reasons that you ha can't even ex uh, 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 examine. Like that's a good example of like how false consciousness works. And some people get mad about the idea of false consciousness because they say. Um, they say that it's like condescending. I don't think it is if you remember that it, everyone has it. Everyone has false consciousness. Like I've said before, the working ruling class doesn't rule in their own interest. They rule in the perception of their own interests, which they undermine all the time because they don't have all the information and they're always competing with one another. But like you have a level of awareness, you have enough awareness to have to understand that this country is in a crisis and you're horrified and you're alienated from it. But you are not aware, you have not absorbed the necessary information through experience and, and exposure to even create a viable way to criticize the country as you perceive it in your head. And so you have to find a solution. And like, Q is the only way. Q is the only way. And the pe first people to do it were the most, like I, I talk about how some people are the most sensitive antenna. The people who are more emotionally compromised and undermined by living under in contemporary conditions than the rest of us for specific reasons having to do with their specific lives. And it's gotten bigger as, as that condition, as the heightening of alienation 
becomes deeper. And as the fear becomes higher of what might come next, and that's why children are the focus of it and why children are the focus of all right-wing populist paranoia. Because there's a sense that the future, uh, that, that the present is fucked, that America at the moment is awful, and that life for you is miserable. But, so it's too late. So what you get to be mad about is what the lizard people and the triple parentheses people are going to steal from your children, from the future, because you don't see the possibility of a future. And certainly that's true of people on the left. Nobody can see it. And uh, people across the center, no one can imagine a future. But that, that hits different depending on your ideological priors. And for conservatives, it manifests as a desire to protect literal children because that's the level of analysis they're on. They're not aware of what they're actually worried about, which is the fact that the future does not appear to exist on our current trajectory. Not in terms of annihilation even, but in terms of change towards the better. The future is just this but shittier. I have seen the future, it is murder. So, uh, that means that Q is going to only become more popular as more people turn up the need for a more heightened and more dramatic and more melodramatic explanation for their alienation and their horror. And Q will do. Q will do. Because it's the only thing there. And so, yeah, I'd say, uh, I say Q is, Q is the future of the right is the future of the right. And I also think it's a religious revival. I think it's the third great, uh, I think it's the third great awakening. The most Q mindset movie I think is JFK. And we said this when we did our movie review episode of it is because uh, JFK posits a sort of right reactionary fairy tale whereby an evil force within the, the greater good that was America made up of decadent perverts who want to keep doing decadent perversions conspire to kill a president who was going to undermine their power and stop them from being perverted. I mean, there's literally a scene, the first scene that where Jim Garrison starts to have second thoughts about Kennedy is when he's on an airplane with uh, Russell Long, played by Walter Matthau. And Walter Matthau is talking about the, the Vietnam War and how it's burning out of control, but also about all the hippies in the streets. And Jim Garrison goes, I, I begin, I, I wonder if, I kind of think it all went bad after Kennedy died. And if you have a cultural uh, lens through which you're looking at politics, which they all do, and you, and you are horrified, repulsed by America's culture, as many of them are, you'll look back, as many people have, and see the 60s as the culprit. And there, I think that's the reason that JFK Jr. figures so spectacularly in their, uh, in their cosmology. I mean, he's the returned Messiah. I mean, these people are also deeply Christian. I mean, it should be pointed out that the whole thing is evangelical as shit. Like, this is just a politicization of evangelicalism. It's a furthering of the moral majority move from the sidelines to the, to the, to the center of American politics of evangelicals over the past 40 years. And JFK is, the, is Jesus returned to, to judge the wicked and the righteous. And it's important to remember, the JFK Jr. thing is not from a Q proof. That was people uh, operating independently. Okay, this is interesting. Someone says, no civil war, but what about something like the Troubles? 
Uh, that I could definitely see more likely. Now we might be talking. You could see an escalation to like low level street warfare between semi-organized groups. I think it would take a while to get to, to anywhere like the organization of the provisional IRA or, or even the, uh, uh, the loyalist paramilitaries, who mostly were just drug dealers, by the way, and still are. Uh, but you'd have something like it, car bombs, shooting things up. But I think what a lot of people assume is that that would cause this cycle whereby everyone would start picking up guns. And that's not what happened in Northern Ireland, and I don't think it was what had happened here either. Someone remind me, I don't want to do it today because I, I don't, I'm, I'm still trying to like rev back up into the like abstract stuff, but I want to go deeper into Gnosticism on one point because somebody, uh, somebody said something about Gnosticism in the, in the chat that made me raise my eye, they, they, eyebrow. They said like, Gnosticism doesn't require Satan if you think God fucked up and like, wouldn't God have to fuck up to allow a demon to enter interact with with uh because god could do anything right like that's always been a question and i think the thing that in my mind squares that circle is if you understand obviously like a lot of this is all filtered through outmoded symbolic orders that we don't really translate but i think the real maybe not understood intellectually but understood spiritually the real uh Demiurge, the real interceding force uh, that created the hell of, of the demiurgical reality uh, is the experience of consciousness, specifically the experience of time. Because, and, as, and so that, uh, because if we assume like as I do, that God is really just our closest to the bone symbolic representation of the concept of unity, the unity of all things and all things in the universe and the universe and you, well, the notion that all, that there is no fundamental separation between any object in the universe there is one substance in the universe, as Spinoza said, and that we are all composed of it and make up the eddies within it. And that the thing that made this world, this fallen world, this world that is choking on its own gas, that is, that is a process of committing suicide, um... is that we evolved intense enough sensory organs and, and, a, and a mental ability to process sensory information that was sufficient to create an inflection point where we, get, we, were, we received so much sensory data that we were able to create such a detailed map of the world around us that we were able to convince ourselves, basically, to consciously act. To take a step here instead of a step there. Not the way that lower animals do. Lower animals take a step instead of a stutter step uh, because they're instinctively reacting. A conscious creature acts, puts one foot in front of the other because there's something deep enough in his brain to convince him to make one move over another move. And the more sensory data you can create, the richer and more textured that picture of the past of the of the of the recent past but the past 
the greater the degree you can imagine project forward what would happen if you do this versus that, and then you do one, creating a tunnel that we can burrow through reality with. And that has like a narrow evolutionary uh, benefit. It, the way if you're a hominid and you're a, 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 you know, a furry, you don't have spikes, you can't run that fast. Uh, and especially if conditions that you live in change quickly, in cr the ability to plan ahead is useful. But the problem is, the more you are able to live in the past and the future, which is what a, a more conscious mind can do, the less you are able to literally be present. And in the moment of existence, not the processing of the moment, not the imagining the past and the future and the side, the presence, the sensory presence of the moment, there is an awareness of that unity. And at that point, fear, if not eliminated, is removed, is leached away. Desire likewise. Because we have to feel separate to ever feel like the rest of the world could endanger us. Because what are they endangering if we are the same? They are endangering the separate entity of me. But I can only sustain that uh, delusion if I am not present. And so the more intense our mental landscape, the less present we are. And that means that we are ruled by fear and desire as we navigate a world between choices that we think might lead us to pleasure or pain. And in so doing, we create the need to, we create the desire to gain, take more than we give. To take from others who otherwise we might understand implicitly to be part of a holistic unit, even if it's not, it's not the entire universe. It is a network of beings that can maintain that sense of safety because that's why we seek others because they provide a simulacrum of the safety that we feel when we feel unity it's not the same thing but it's close we can sleep easily because we're in a, we're surrounded by people we trust and that's why we build communities and that's when social evolution kicks in and that's when we cease to be evol we cease to evolve individually and we evolve as a group but in so doing you accumulate separateness over time and as you get more intense in your perception and as conditions become more endangering we seek ways to gain comfort and the comfort one great way to perceive comfort is to rest while others work is to gain food and, and items that have been imbued with value and experiences that have been imbued with value that others don't get to have. And now you have in, now you've let lip you have created the engine of history here. And you have also created the drive towards the creation of structures that push us ever farther away from the present and push us ever farther from unity and ever farther from God. But we have to work through those things. And as we are driven away from each other by entropy, we also are grasping for one another. And the class project, the socialist project, uh, the, 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 the slow but steady coming into awareness of itself, of the, of the oppressed class, is the process of people reaching out to grab one another in the void. And the best way to start that process, I think, is to have a real understanding of love personified in maybe a religious concept, but that's very hard to hold on to in a world where other people have different understandings of that religion, and that causes intellectual dis disagreements and alienation. Like, people can hold on to religion 
and hold on to love and hold on to unity, maybe in cloistered religious communities. And I think that's possible. But in, in the secular world that we live in, the closest thing is love for one person. One person who can stand in for the moment. One person who, because you know them fully, you are fully comfortable with and feel fully safe with. And therefore, drain from every moment of your life uncertainty and fear because you are able to tack back to unity and away from the idea that you could ever be a threat, in threat threatened, the idea that there could ever be an end to life or your life, the idea that pleasure can be accumulated and that it could offset pain somehow. And so that is, I think, where, what love, where love emerges. Like, when you love someone, when you fall in love with someone, you are gr gaining such a degree of comfort and intimacy with that person th that you aren't afraid. And that means if you spend time with that person, all the time you spend with that person is time that drains from your life the accumulation of anxiety the accumulation of difference, the feeling of spinning away into nothingness. And even when you're away from them, when you're in a time and something is stressful, you can think back, you can think about them. And when you have that idea in your mind, when you can picture love in an embodied person, you can then project it outward. Not with the same degree of, of passion, not with the same degree of certainty, but, but still qualitatively powerful sense of love to others. And that means that when you react to the world, you will react from a position of loving kindness instead of self-interest, instead of the rat, reptile, reptile, unseen drive towards personal pleasure. More fun than not fun, because I'm going to die someday, so I need all the fun I can get. Fuck unfun things. The distinctions become less relevant. And so actions that might seem like shit work now, like going door to door for a campaign or walking a picket line, uh, maybe if it comes to it, like real conflict with the state, become pleasures in themselves because they are pursued out of love. The way that it's not work to do something for someone you love. It's not work to do something uh, to, for, to do for people that you love. And that's the only way that you can bring down the, 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 the pillars of the demiurgical reality which are every day reinforced, every moment reinforced. Because hypothetically, hypothetically, you could snap your fingers and everyone could come into full consciousness of their unity for a moment, come away from it, be able to connect to each other immediately at like a base bonded level, and we would have a new world. But that's not how it works because we're separate, because we have different experiences, because of the randomness of chance that brings us to different points in the social order when we emerge into it, a deformed social, social order created by the nightmare of every past generation. We have to work towards it. We have to stumble into the hallways. We have to blindly find our way. And that is the process of, of class struggle. That is the, the dialectical relationship working its way through the human uh, species. Never mind, I guess I just said it. I said I wasn't going to say it today, but I kind of got on a roll. I hope it made sense, because I wasn't, ex I wasn't a planning to talk about that today.
squibs. I'm really getting to the point where I have to sort of come to terms with the fact that I'm not getting squibs anymore and that I need to just decide to stop watching new action films or stop caring about squibs. Because this third thing where I just watch them and feel annoyed is pointless. Why do that? I will hope, I think the, the more mature thing would just be to stop caring about, I mean, obviously the most mature thing is to stop watching movies of any kind, certainly action movies, but I'm not ever going to get to that level, I don't think. Uh, but more realistically, I could just get rid of my weird squib fixation. I will say, though, that um, I do hope, I understand, I'm coming to terms with the fact that if there are movies with squibs in the future, they will be like... Um, It'll be like The Lighthouse, It'll, where they used old film from the 20s. It'll be a gimmick. And that's fine. I just hope enough people do the gimmick so that I can get my fix once in a while. I would certainly hope that the Safties would use squibs if they made a movie. I did see Let the Corpses Tan. That wasn't, it wasn't really my thing, but it was, it was inter interesting. CGI could get better, but I honestly don't think it will. I think that's one of those things that just, it can't, it can't, it can't simulate presence. The guest had squibs. You bet your, you better believe that the guest had squibs. Uh, your next also had squibs. Now, Wingard and Barrett, those guys are old school. I like them. Well, not somebody asked why isn't the point to be challenged by art? I don't think, I don't think watching bad action movies that are clearly intended for a foreign market because the scripts are written by algorithms and machine learning is really uh, challenging and in a sense uh, challenging anything other than your patience, which has its you know benefits psychically, but I, I would rather be challenged intellectually. Um, I just watched the Harley Quinn movie. I was just had it on TV. You know, I was doing other things. I shouldn't have been doing that, but but I just wanted some something under the background. And at one point, she's in a grocery store with a girl, and she says, "I need more grocery. I need more groceries." No, no, I'm sorry. She says, "I'm out of groceries." And then she starts shopping. And that hit my ear in the theater wrong. And hearing it again, it hit it even worse. No one would ever say, I'm out of groceries, right? I'm not crazy about that. Groceries are the stuff that you get at the store. As soon as you bring them into your house and put them away, they're the individual food, and collectively they're food. You'd say, I'm out of food, or I need to get groceries. Groceries are at the store. You cannot be out of groceries unless you live in a grocery store. And that's such a... But the thing, the reason that if that's not... I don't think that's just being pedantic, because... When I say nobody says that, I don't think anyone would say that. Like, I think most basically human beings, English speakers, have been wired to understand the difference between groceries and food. So who wrote that line? My suspicion is that it was like a fucking algorithm or like a, a bot that somebody programmed. And then even if that happened, how did, how did, I mean, I'm assuming Australians are human beings, although that's still out. Has a Margot Robbie encountered, maybe, maybe they don't have groceries. They might not have groceries in Australia. They're probably called groceros or something. But other people on that set, director on down, none of it hit their ear wrong. It not, none of it sounded weird to anybody. It's uh. It's just, it's, it's, it's worrying to me that, th that that kind of thing could happen. And it certainly reminds me of why we get squibs all over the place, because clearly nobody really gives a shit about any of this stuff. Nobody's putting any effort into any of it. Everyone at some level understands it to be machine line hack work, which I have to say makes the fact that people put so much emotional investment in superhero movies 
and 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 have to and de, and demand people take them seriously as art either because they're gritty and realistic like DC people, or or important and uh, and representation if they're Marvel people, is that the people making them for the most part don't give a fuck. I don't buy the line that it's about a foreign market because it's going to get translated anyway, right? But the thing that's weird about that and freaks me out about it is that it's not it's not a bad line in the sense that it's poorly written. It's not written like a human being who speaks English would write it. I guess maybe they're like a foreign language, foreign, first, foreign first language person. Okay, fair enough then. Zack Snyder cares because he, the reason they love him is the same way as the reason that Republican people love Trump is because Sanders, Snyder is one of them and they know it. Like you ever listen to a Zack Snyder interview, he is one of those guys. He's just in better shape and richer and uh, definitely more talented. He had this, uh, he had, a, somebody was making fun of his movie, uh, and, or he said that it was, uh, what was the, what was the fucking tweet that Snyder had where he said, uh, to, to A.O. Scott, he said, you like movies for babies, I make movies for adults. This movie's for grown-ups, so I don't care if you don't like it. And it's like, come on, that's so perfect. The guy believes the same bullshit they do. He believes the same fantasy that this, this stunted and deformed, uh, quasi art form known as superhero fil filmmaking is something that is for adults not something for children that adults watch because it's easier to make than stuff for adults because too much money is put into it for any singular vision to dominate or even a collaborative artistic vision to dominate over the algorithm of profit which demands 13 PG-13 pablum for the lowest common denominator And you've got a guy making these movies, making $100 million movies, who believes this garbage. Who believes he's making movies for adults that are like, dude, what if Superman was real? Like, what would that be like? He's still going to fight a fucking space squid either way. And so having Snyder out there really believing that. It makes the it makes him that much easier to have the uh, intellectual... Tra the... the Emotional and psychic transference to, to become a Snyder stan and end up trolling and uh, death threatening everybody who goes online to say that uh, Snyder movies are bad even after you get what you want. I don't know what the black enlightenment is. I know dark enlightenment. Dark enlightenment was was what people called the alt right when it was just guys in capes. The sea people were a theoretized group of marauding Mediterranean uh, sort of pirate societies, or like Vikings probably, who uh, raided late Bronze Age. Uh, societies like uh, Egypt uh, and, and helped cause the late Bronze Age collapse. Uh, nowadays, there, it's usually understood that, like with most social collapses, the real causes were long-term soil erosion, volcanic eruption, uh, and social breakdown. But that the, the sea people, these guys might have showed up to fuck up the, uh, fuck some shit up for them and make it collapse.
Who was the first non-liberal president? I mean, it depends on what you mean by liberal. I don't think we've had one. All right, I'm going to wrap up here. Uh, maybe I'll take one question. Boss Baby 2. I will come I will watch Boss Baby 2. Because hopefully it will involve uh Getting more detail about the weird ass boss baby world that uh, that they created, where the babies are manufactured, this nightmare like uh, eternal capitalism. Ooh, brutal! I'd like to know more. Like I said, do they drive to baby houses? Are there baby restaurants? Do they go to baby strip clubs? Do they do baby cocaine? I think Ed Markey is going to win, which will be very funny. First competitive primary lost by a Kennedy ever in that state. Maybe the, the, the downfall of that dynasty can be a, a silver lining in the current moment. But it would also be really, really funny if Kennedy won anyway. Oh, is RFK Jr. at that rally in uh, Germany against masks? That's funny. That guy's really interesting because he is sort of a, he's a Marin County, like, uh, crunchy kook, basically. Uh, and it would be very funny if he did make the Q jump because then you would have an actual Kennedy at the head of this thing instead of, uh, instead of the fake guy pretending to be JFK Jr., So that would be funny if, if RFK ended up running on like a Q party platform. Like Q got so big that it broke and, and so infused with like non right, non Republican and non like self consciously reactionary cranks, like other anti vax people. Like I said, if, uh, if, if, if Trump gets elected and starts vaccinating people, you could see Q, depending on how leavened it got with uh, anti vaxxers. Uh, decide that he got like replaced by a deep state robot or something and then hell that'd be hilarious and then like rally behind rfk jr that would be that would be hilarious that would be great we can't know things we can guess we can guess. We do trial and error, and the way we test it is what other people react, how other people react. That's why we need, that's why, like, the, the, the root of technology is collaboration. No knowledge is siloed. That's, I remember I actually read Atlas Shrugged. I read the whole thing. And uh, I skimmed a lot of it, obviously, because it's so repetitive. But the way that a Ayn Rand conce conceived of, uh, of invention and technological progress was so insane in her cosmology every person who is like the inventor of a thing essentially is the is is deserves by inventing it all associated progress and that they can like dole it out then in exchange for like market share or something it's it, you could take the greatest genius in world history. You could take fucking Nikola Tesla or fucking uh, uh, any of the great innovators like uh, Edison or something. If you had them just, if you dropped them on the top of a hill like a deformed Spartan child, none of them would invent shit. They would die of exposure. Maybe a few of them would 
be in a, be uh, clever enough to create like a Quonset hut. But nothing is created without people collaborating across the space of uh, of unknown existence and comparing. Like nothing, nobody could invent anything beca because the they're at the end of a process that began with the formation of the language they're thinking in and the numbers that they're using to write with. And every single element within the nested technologies that make up whatever the hell they're going to build on top of. And that's why, that's why libertarianism is just so laughable and why the idea that there are people who consider themselves like geniuses who, 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 who take Rand seriously and objectivism seriously. It really does tell you that like there are different ways to be intelligent and that we are defined by our ignorance. And one of the things that makes us define that ends up making us most defined by our ignorance is by our refusal to admit that we don't are, we aren't the full container of the world. We have to fill gaps. And one of the things that makes love possible is that when you love someone, one of the reasons you love them probably is because, not because they exactly mirror your mind, what your preferences, your experience, but because they have had different experiences and they come to different conclusions that fill in the gaps for you and that make it easier for both of you to navigate the world successfully because you're getting more information and you're operating from a correct premise because you've collaborated. You complete me, literally, in the sense that you fill the hole of perception because of the, because of the non-overlapping experiences and, and, and sensitivities that we possess. If everybody had to act like a Randian hero, there would be no human existence. It would be a bunch of people with blindfolds on swinging katanas at one another in a fucking room. How would that turn out? All right. I went over a little bit. So, yeah. No, someone... Oh, just to end here. Someone says, is American libertarianism the basis for neo-feudalism? Of course. Because it says... It takes the logic... The liberal logic of the market to such an extent that... Because feudalism replaced obligations, right? Social obligations with transactions. But transactions are assumed to be between equal parties. And all economic uh, uh, theory and, this, and all libertarian uh, uh, ethics are premised on equal exchange. But of course, exchange isn't equal because of the accumulated history of exploitation that makes up the human race and human existence. And so... Uh, that accumulates social pressure, tension, and conflict. Ayn Rand's solution to the fact that there's so many people who are resent, even though it's like, isn't it irrational? Even though these titans of industry create the world for people, they're not happy with it, and they whine about it. What's the answer to that? Her answer to that is they're dumb. And that what should happen is you just tell them about it until their stupid asses understand it. Well, guess what? That hasn't worked and can't work. What's going to happen is you're going to create a, a, a social order so fractured that the market will not be able to be sustained because you won't be able to sustain social order. So you have to replace social order with coercive bilateral relationships. But this way, totally detached from a social order. A negative dialectic. But as I, and like, you want to know what neo-feudalism it is? It's, it's going to be feudalism, but without the time off. Or the friends, or the family, or the religious awe, the peace, nothing. You will be, stimulus response, you'll be desire and fear turned into a node. They're going to prod you at one end with one or the other, and it's going to get behavior out of the other end. You're just going to be a neuron. And there will be no more social texture. That the, the, the liberal order presumes this market that we exchange in. 
No more money for that. No more time for that. That is replaced by bondage, by, by compulsion. But of course, not entirely compulsion, not just gun to the head. Like I said, pleasure too. Some boobs on the screen. Uh, uh, some some uh, chicken congealed patties to consume. Uh, perhaps Marvel film or two, if you're good. Whew. All right, guys. Uh, I'm back. Back in the New York groove. Talk to you soon. Bye-bye.